Good morning, guys. It is Friday, January 12, 2024. This is Bathrobe Business. I come to you with the news and my coffee. So starting a little bit later today because I like to sleep in a bit on Friday, so I got an extra 30 hours of shut-eye. Uh, so there's a lot going on this morning. Earnings season is out, and there's a lot of major players with a lot of major changes and a lot of concerning stuff going on with banks. Uh, so we'll start with the big one. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, their profit fell uh, after the $2.9 billion fees they had to pay to purchase up the regional banks last year, the SVBs, uh, the signatures. So those assets that they had to pay due to some restructuring and stuff, they had to pay fees to the federal government, they fell $2.9 billion. Uh, now, when you actually delve into the details, it's actually not that bad because overall they would have still had record profits and they still did have record profits for in a lot of regards for the year. So it's really just like a nonsense story. Uh, they are doing quite well, in fact. And uh, if it hadn't been for that, they would have had uh, record-breaking profits this year. They just had to pay that $2.93 billion uh, to uh, the federal government for those asset purchases. Other than that, they would have had record profit. Uh, in fact, the interesting thing with them is unlike a lot of uh, other uh, banks, they had a record of net income from interest rates. So whether that is holding deposits, uh, payments on loans, uh, bonds, they made $24.2 billion off of high interest rates just last year. That is more than any other bank ha did during last year or any other bank has ever done in history. So it's kind of funny that, uh, what is it, 150 years after uh, Chase Bank was founded, it's still the, the behemoth that it was from day one. If you don't know the story of J.P. Morgan Chase, it's fascinating. Just go on YouTube, uh, look up the story of J.P. Morgan Chase, and the, the, the James Pierpont Morgan was his full name. Uh, he was a powerhouse. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very interesting story. I would recommend you guys check that out. Uh, in other news, Bank of America shell, uh, shares have fallen, actually. So they are down, um, let's see, $3.1 billion. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. They are down more than 50%. They were supposed to be at $7.1 billion. They are down to $3.1 billion in quarterly profits. Uh, that's pretty major. And now their biggest dif difficulty is what kind of was happening with SVB. They have a lot of uh, low-yield bonds that are dragging them down. It is a little concerning. I mean, I don't think Bank of America has the liquidity problems that SVB does. But still, when you hear something like that, and we had a bank failure last year specifically for that reason, it kind of makes you think twice. Uh, Citigroup is the biggest one. Uh, well, I guess not the biggest loss, but the one that's probably going to be instituting the biggest changes. So uh, they posted a $1.8 billion fourth quarter loss. However, they're planning to cut 20,000 roles across the company, uh, and, and this could save them as much as $2.5 billion. That is massive. Uh, and there's other cuts in the tech sector I'm going to talk about here in just a minute, but the cuts just keep on coming. Um, I actually know someone personally. They were this close to losing their job uh, yesterday, and they downsized half the work staff there. Uh, so she lost uh, essentially everyone that worked underneath her, but they spared her. Uh, and over the week, you know, I've been reporting lots of job cuts. We've reported cuts at Amazon, uh, Google, and Audacity, the uh, the gaming company. They cut their workforce by 25%. And now Citigroup is going to be cutting by 20,000 roles. That is crazy. Uh, the only bank that everything seems to be going smoothly with is Wells Fargo. But that is also because they had major cuts last year. So Wells Fargo cut half of their workforce last year. And uh, I know someone that works at Wells. And they were this close to losing their job. They've completely restructured a bunch of roles, uh, consolidated a bunch of different positions into one. And so uh, this is probably what helped bolster their uh, their record-breaking quarter. So they had a revenue of uh, $20.48 billion versus the estimated $20.3 billion. Uh, so Wells Fargo is the only one where things are going okay. But again, a lot of it is because of major cuts. Uh, another major cut in the tech field is Discord. Discord cut 17% of its workforce uh, as it's heading into 2024. So another tech company, another major cut. Uh, you know, up until today, I would have thought that a lot of these cuts were just localized with the uh, tech sector. I think tech sectors are the most prominent uh, because we're hearing so much about them and these companies are such behemoths. 
uh, a lot of these unicorns, but they are just cutting, cutting, cutting. But now we're seeing it in the banking sector and across multiple sectors. Cuts are coming everywhere. This is interesting, though, because unemployment didn't rise last year, uh, despite the fact that many companies were cutting jobs left and right. And that is very interesting. And I, 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 I'm not being conspiratorial. I just don't understand uh, what's going on. If all these jobs are being cut, we're not seeing unemployment tick up a little bit. I know we've talked about before that uh, uh, there are more jobs open than people are, there are to fill them. However, uh, a lot of these uh, cuts come from specialty roles that uh, a person would be holding out for another position of uh, similar wage structure, et cetera. So for example, if you're a banker at Wells Fargo, you're not all of a sudden going to start go working at Trader Joe's. Uh, you're going to look for a similar position, whether you're in underwriting or a VP position or whatever. So I am curious about where these people are going uh, when these cuts are happening and why the uh, unemployment rate is not ticking up considering how many cuts are coming. Now, you, I, again, the, the company that uh, my friend works for, she, like I said, almost lost her job yesterday. They are a, a well-known company, definitely not a JP Morgan or a Citigroup, but they are a well-known company and they probably have hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue per year, if not a billion. Uh, and that didn't make the headlines. So uh, when companies like that are cutting and we don't hear about it, how many companies are doing that? Why isn't that unemployment rate ticking up? Uh, I don't have a good answer. I'm just asking if you know, give me a comment in the uh, comment section. Uh, but yeah, next story, uh, we're going to move on to, uh, I guess I'll move on to BlackRock. So BlackRock has bought uh, Global Infrastructure Partners, which is the United States' largest infrastructure developer. And it's in a, ca a cash on stock deal of about $12 billion. So BlackRock, being the behemoth that they are, are heavily investing in infrastructure. This is uh, pretty much on trend with what we've been seeing because uh, infrastructure is a major play right now. Um, obviously, the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, uh, we're seeing a lot of offshoring happening. Uh, there's been a movement to deglobalize. Uh, no matter how quickly or slowly that moves, it has been in the cards now for multiple administrations, uh, multiple members of Congress, it seems to have bipartisan support. And it is moving forward with more and more heavy infrastructure. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but when we talked about U.S. steel uh, being purchased by Nippon Steel in Japan, a large part of it had to do with infrastructure because uh, Nippon Steel is seeing major investments in U.S. infrastructure, and that's going to be using exclusively U.S.-based steel manufacturing. And so with most of them, I shouldn't say all of them, but because they're government contracts, that usually is the case. So because of that, they're looking to invest and gain a great return on their investment because they know that a lot of the steel that's going to be manufactured here in the next couple of months, next couple of years, I should say, is going to be integrated very quickly into the U.S. infrastructure plans. Uh, so that was entirely an infrastructure play as well. We didn't really talk. I don't believe I mentioned in that video, but that was a very powerful driving force. And now BlackRock is getting into it as well. Uh, last story uh, of the day is Delta. Uh, Delta more than doubles their fourth quarter profits uh, to $13.66 billion versus $13.52 billion. Uh, mostly this is actually with international travel. Their domestic travel has been more or less unchanging. It's, it's good and not great, uh, but their international travel is growing uh, exponentially. And then they're also offering premium products, uh, first class um, cabins, etc., and that seems to be uh, driving a ton of it. They, they're seeing 15% revenue boosts from their premium products. So people have money to spend. This is why I think the recession is not coming. People definitely have money to spend, but the economy is definitely uh, a dynamic one at, at best. Uh, we're seeing massive cuts, massive changes, massive restructures, yet inflation is still very high. Unemployment is very low. Uh, it's very chaotic. There's no single trend that anyone can point to the economy and say, oh, this economy is doing great, or no, this economy is doing terrible. It's uh, almost like it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, depending on who you are, your position, and where you are in this economy. Uh, that's pretty much it as far as the major headlines. I'm just going to review the uh, the numbers. I didn't do that at the beginning. Uh, the market is already open. I, like I said, I'm posting this video a bit late. Uh, Dow is down 71 points. S&P is down 8 uh, NASDAQ is down 34. Uh, oil is actually ticked up a little bit. It is at $74 a barrel. Uh, crypto, I'm going to mention because it's in the news about uh, the ETF. Uh, Bitcoin is down uh, to about 45,382, uh, 45,300. 
$328 per coin. Uh, and then my favorite indicator, gold, is ticked back up. So uh, I know I was a little happy yesterday when it ticked down. Remember those that watch my channel, gold is like a thermometer, it's like a temperature. If gold is above $2,000 an ounce, the economy has a temperature, it's not healthy. If gold is below $2,000 an ounce, the economy is doing good. Well, gold was at 2035 yesterday when I did the video. Today it's back up to 2061. It's gained, uh, according to this right now, $41 per ounce. Uh, we don't like that. Uh, I would hope that that was lower. This could be entirely inflation. So that, that thermometer thing I talked about is, is simply the fact that historically, every time in the last 20 years, gold has edged up towards 20,000. It's usually because of a crisis, an imminent crisis, or post an imminent crisis. And the fact that it's above 2000 makes me a little concerned. However, that is uh, after we've had multiple years of, at times, almost double digit inflation. So uh, I guess maybe this is the new baseline that 2040 is the new 2000 or maybe 2040 is the new 1000. I don't know. Uh, I'm not quite into that world that deep to be able to tell you how these numbers adjust for inflation. But uh, just going off of a simple metric that I've always held, uh, I don't like that. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's all the stories I have for today. I hope you guys have a productive Friday. I will see you Monday morning.